Hey there, welcome back to another episode of Grief to Growth Podcast, where we explore the multifaceted nature of grief and the lessons that can teach us about life, about love, about the strength of the human spirit. I'm your host, Brian, Brian Smith, and today I have the privilege of introducing a guest whose life's tapestry is woven with threads of education, of advocacy, and the enduring power of storytelling. Uh, please w- welcome me, join me in welcoming Kevin O'Connor. Kevin is not only a seasoned educator and a fierce advocate for LGBTQ rights and sexual health, but he's also an accomplished author and performer whose voice has graced both the page and the stage. His latest work we're going to talk about today is his book, Two Floors Above Grief, and it's a poignant exploration of life as a son of a funeral director and the rich legacy of family stories told through letters. In today's conversation, we'll talk about Kevin's experiences, We'll discuss the intricacies of starting and maintaining a business of nurturing marriage and family life within the new unique context of the funeral industry and the ways in which personal grief intertwines with the grief of others. And we'll talk about um, his, his insights on sharing or enriching family history by organizing ancestors' letters, revealing the powerful continuity and connections that they hold. So I think this is an episode that promises to touch on the practicalities of life amidst death but also talk about the emotional and spiritual growth that can emerge from such um, from such experiences. So with that, I want to welcome to Grief to Growth, Kevin O'Connor. Brian, that was a wonder. Thank you for that introduction. I I haven't had a podcast host take what I gave them and really made it make it your own. Uh, I, I, I'm thinking I, I may use what you just wrote as the, the next blurb from my book because <laughs> it may help with the marketing but i re- you're that was eloquent what you said thanks very much well, thank thanks you very it, much it's, mm-hmm. it's good to meet you it's great to have you here today um i know you have a very unusual story um so you your book is two floors above grief uh, i would say you grew up above a funeral home, but you actually grew up in a funeral home. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I know there were some unique things other than just the fact that you grew up in a funeral home. So tell me about that experience. Oh, uh, well, just the idea. When I first ventured into writing this book, uh, well, I've, I've been writing it for, I'm 73 years old. I've been writing it for 73 years, I think. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. the stories, the stories and things, uh, and the influence and the experiences started at birth, actually. Uh, my dad was already well established in the funeral home industry by the time I was born. Uh, the uh, and when in part of the title it it talks about the unique place we called home. It's not it's not so much unique to have a funeral home family live near or in or above or next to a funeral home. That was especially true uh, before the advent of internet and cell phones and uh, ways to communicate because a, a funeral homeowner needed to be right on the premises at all time it's because death happens as you talk about on your other um, podcast that I've listened to, you know, death, death has no schedule. It happens at any time. Right. So in our case, uh, my dad and my uncle operated this funeral home in a uh, Victorian house that they had purchased in, in the late thirties, converted the first floor into a, a funeral home and the top two floors were converted into apartments. Uh, second floor was where my aunt and uncle and their three daughters lived. And my mom and dad and my two brothers and I lived in the third floor. Another thing, I guess, there's a lot of unique things about the house itself. If, if uh, you or your listeners just picture an old Victorian house, they usually aren't built to be a funeral home. <laughs> they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're built on the first floor with welcoming parlors and butler's kitchens and dining areas. And the second floor is usually bedrooms. And then the third floor in this particular house was a ballroom. It had two stages in it, beautiful hardwood floors and two stages. So when my mom and dad uh, moved in with my older brother in 1940, he was just a baby. They had to, they needed to convert this space uh, of a ballroom into their apartment. And so they put up walls and designed and created bedrooms and kitchens and a bathroom and but what one thing they didn't do, and I don't know why, initially for the first 10 years, well, for the first 15 years they lived there, they kept the stages there. So uh, my bedroom had a, my brother's bedroom, and we had a stage in the bedroom. And then the room that was designated, we called the back room, but essentially it's what most families would call a family room. That also had a stage in it. Hmm. So you mentioned in your intro that, you know, I, I 
like to perform on on stage and i think that's partly because my crib and my twin bed and up until i was age nine my bed or crib was right next to this stage wow and so it wasn't unusual for me or my brothers or my cousins or friends to get up on the stage and put on plays and there was an area underneath the stage that my parents used for storage but it was great for kid games and hiding and hide and go seek and things like that just to, to, to do stuff in a, in a play mode but um and the other unique thing on, on top of being just living in a funeral home the other unique thing about the two families was um for me to get to the apartment where i lived on the third third floor where my mom and dad and two brothers lived, I had to walk through the apartment of my, um, my aunt and uncle and mm. um, my three cousins who are a little older than me. So, um, so the concept of privacy, when my dad and uncle decided to create this living environment, I I'm pretty sure they knew that they were giving up some privacy, especially for my aunt and uncle. Uh, we actually on the third floor had a little more privacy, but for me, it wasn't unusual for me to come up the back stairs after playing or coming home from school. And as I stepped off the top step on the first uh, set of stairs, I was right next to my aunt's kitchen, who was that was usually where she was. She would greet me. She'd ask how my day was. My uncle might be around. Uh, my cousins might be in and out. Um, uh, and so the idea that I had really two sets of parents, and that's what I talk about in the book, too, that what made it unique was I had two sets of parents, people that, for the most part, 98% part, I guess, got along. Mm. Uh, so uh, it was a bonus that these two brothers uh, decided to have this business. But again, uh, the families uh, got along. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, even in the 19, I point out in the book that in the 1950s, 50 census that was just released in the last year or so, I went and looked at it and it, it listed my three cousins and my myself and my older brother. My younger brother had been born yet, but it listed us as brothers and sisters. Hmm. <laughs> so we always teased each other that we were raised as brothers and sisters in this environment. And then I just felt, gee, this is the census taker sort of confirmed that in 1950. And um, the cousins have passed on. So that's, you know, that's part of my grief story, too. Mm. Uh, out of the 10 of us that live there, it's just myself and my two brothers that 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 are still in this this area of living uh, mm -hmm. on, on Earth. Everybody mm -hmm. else has passed on. But uh, those are, I think, some of the in answer to your questions. That's just some of what made it unique. Uh, I address other things throughout the book, but th those are the primary things that I think made my upbringing a little unique. And I didn't, I knew it was unique when I was growing up, but I guess I've realized that even more in the writing of the book. And since mm -hmm. the book was published, I think as people comment on things and I get have podcasts with folks like yourself or make presentations that people say, wow, that was really interesting that you're born in a funeral home. So here I am talking to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that is really, you know, interesting. And, you know, death is something in our society that, you know, we don't, we don't talk about, we try to avoid. So I can only imagine what it was like for you growing up with, you know, people greeting people coming in and stuff. So it's I'm, I'm sure when you were a child you didn't realize how unique it was but since then have you have you i thought about how this has informed the way you think about death and about grieving oh yeah yeah um i get that a similar question a lot of times do 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 i think i perceive death and grief any differently than somebody who might not have lived in that environment and i guess one of the things i've come to understand is I've had many, many a death experience in my life and many grief experiences and talking to friends and family. I really don't think my approach to it is it probably any different. Hmm. Uh, yes, I think it's probably uh, it, it was it, I learned at an early age that that death can happen at any time, that there is no schedule. I, I, know, I know you know that all too well. Mm -hmm. Um based on the, uh, your podcast that I've listened to. But on the, on the other hand, when it does happen, when death happens, uh, the impact it's ha had on me is similar to anybody else I've spoken to. It's, 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 uh, you mentioned earlier, it's, um, 
uh, let's see, multifaceted. I wrote that down. The multi-tiered, multifaceted uh, aspects. I just uh, one of my closest cousin died two weeks ago today at age ninety, and we gathered for her services in in, in Indiana, and um, and she was she was a cousin of the undertaking family, so she was all very familiar uh, mm. and grew up not did not growing up in the house, but spent a lot of time there. But and certainly these early two weeks and she had prepared me for her going and she had a uncanny, she was a, a, a Catholic um, sister, Catholic nun. Mm. And she uh, and I talked to her two, three times a month. And, and in the last few years, she's just been telling me I'm very ready. I'm ready to go. And she stayed very active and alert, still better, still in a bed a lot, but her mind was really good. And even in my last conversation with her three weeks ago, she was talking about, I'm ready now and I'm ready. And mm -hmm. she just passed away in her sleep two weeks ago. So, um, and that's those kind of situations aren't, I'm not a stranger to that or all the other ways people pass on or people die. I mean, mm -hmm. she, she certainly died in a way that she'd almost prescribed for herself, fortunately, but in, in a quiet way and in, in a way that just at age 90, that her body led her to that, mm -hmm. you know, certainly other as other times of death, they're a lot more shocking. So I think yeah. that answers your question. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. So when you're, I'm just, um, and again, I know it's hard to compare our childhood to other people's childhood because we don't know what their childhood was like, <laughs> but, um, I, I, I can imagine that, you know, did your, did your father and your uncle talk about like the clients that were coming through and, and, and various, because as you said, people die all kinds of ways. We, we think of people as dying. We like to think of people, everybody's old when they die, you know, they all die mm -hmm, quietly mm -hmm. in their bed. Right. So right. what were your experiences like in finding out like, you know, death can happen at any time to anyone. Thanks for that question. I, I think um, certainly I was aware when the phone would ring in the middle of the night and I would hear my dad, he had it on our third floor an apartment as, as phone system changed, as phone systems changed in the fifties and sixties, we had more extensions in the house. Mm. So um, the phone would ring and I would wake up a little bit and I'd hear my dad say, I'll be right there. I'll be right there. And then I would hear him put the phone down. I was probably asleep most times by the time he reached uh, why he, why he left, left the apartment or then I might hear him when he came back later to uh, wake me up to go to school or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I was very aware of how the, that happens at any time of the day, or even if in the, in the middle of the day, if the phone rang, even in the middle of dinner, <laughs> if the phone rang and dad sure. answered it, and he just left, you know, he just left. Whether it was that, we also provided um, ambulance calls. So uh, because there were no paramedics at, at the, in those 50s and 60s, the, the funeral homes in our town took care of that. So those kind of things that happened became a, a part of life for me. Mm -hmm. The uh, the the suddenness, the, the spontaneity of it, I, I guess, for lack of a better word. But to go back to another part of your question. Did um, I, I think, uh, yeah, you ask if, what did I know about the clients? What did I know? What did my dad or uncle or mm -hmm. my mom or aunt share? That was very, um, I respect them more and more for this as I get older. <laughs> and as I've learned more about this, they, they didn't involve us too much in the, uh, in the clients. Mm -hmm. I mean, I certainly some of the families I knew cause they were related to us or, they were friends of the family. Uh, but even with those details, I, I dad and my uncle never <laughs> talked about the process or the preparation process of the, 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 the physical preparation process. Um, and if there was things that happened, certain aspects of this, a particular client's death or a family situation, I, I was never aware of that. Um, and, I, people will, people will ask me, you know, why didn't, how come you don't know so, don't know so much about the business? Cause I never went into it myself. Sure. I said, I, I really, I really think that that's a credit to my parents. And then I, just in the last three weeks or yeah, three months, I came across through a cousin. She found a, uh, a plaque that had been hanging in the uh, preparation room of the funeral home. 
Hmm. And I, I I don't have it in front of me, but the, the gist of the saying was uh, speaking to the, the embalmer, the, um, the undertaker, and it was saying in a general sense, Hey, th- this, this family entrusted this person to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, it's up to you. You have the responsibility to be discreet, to take very good care and to be responsible for mm-hmm. this person, because this person belongs to a family right. and don't, and it, it, there were no don'ts in the thing, but the, the message was, this is private. Um, and this is, it's not a funeral director's purvey to go talking about their clients to their family, to their friends, mm-hmm. to their organizations. And, and I never knew my dad or uncle to do that. So yeah, I knew I was aware there was funerals. I was aware there was a family gathering and, and certainly I helped in different ways in the funeral home, whether it be setting up flowers, uh, putting up chairs, greeting people at the door, running, you know, going on errands for my dad to sure. different things, especially when I started driving. But I, I, I didn't know um, a lot of the, the, what should I say, the, the factors. And I've learned right. that since this by the, there's other podcasts. You may be familiar with some of them. There's other po- podcasts or podcasts available where, Funeral directors speak directly to their experiences and mm-hmm. what happened at the moment of death with this person. And some of those circumstances are pretty gruesome. Right, right. And 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 I, when I've been listening to those, I'm thinking, oh, gee, my dad and uncle must have experienced that, but mm-hmm. I never would have known that. You know, I mean, and it it helped me understand listening to these other people's podcasts, um, other and most of them being funeral directors, just. You know, some of the more of the background mm-hmm. that my dad and uncle chose not to share with us as 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 a family. So I, I really give them a. They've been gone a long time, but it increases the respect I have for them and and the the um, respect they had for the families with whom they worked. Sure. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. So your your father and your uncle that started the I. I so this was not a business that your family was in before then, that your your father and your uncle decided to start it. Is that correct? Oh, my uncle started. He's about uh, eight years older than my dad. And and he he had got interested in it as a 20-something. Uh, hmm. When he lived in Hammond, Indiana, he had worked for a funeral home there in Hammond, Indiana. Mm-hmm. And when, um, but, he, but he wanted to have a funeral home of his own. And there just wasn't an opportunity in that area of Indiana, you know, uh, in Hammond, Gary, that area. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is 1929, 1930. So you look at the economic times, uh, right in the Depression. But that was, and he got married in 1930 uh, to my aunt. And he said he conceived of a plan, which she knew a little bit about, but he, he made some decisions without her, I think. He said, well, I got a chance to move this town called Elgin, Illinois. And I've got an opportunity to start a funeral home and, and rent a house there to get us started. And she says, what? <laughs> We're just getting married. She went along with him. And wow. uh, I think that was more what brides may have done in 1930. You know, yeah. yeah, he was he was the. And so he started it and moved to moved to Elgin, which was about two and a half hours at the time, two and a half to three hours away from where he grew up. And he moved into this town where he. Um, knew nobody except maybe the one person who said there might be an opportunity for him. And he got, and so then, and he took my dad with him. My dad was a high school student at the time, but he took uh, my dad and my dad's sister with him and his parents, my grandparents, and they all worked the funeral home together. And my dad finished high school there and then decided to, to join and met my mom and, and she was from the town. So, my uncle Lawrence started it first and then dad came in about eight, nine years later. Wow. So, and then they, they stayed together as partners until, uh, well, 84, my dad died in 84. So that's, and then the business was sold right about that time Okay, so, when that happened. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious, did you ever consider going into the business? Yeah. Well, my brothers and I have this conversation. I talk in the book too. Um, when my 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 cousins uh they were let's see the oldest one was 19 years older than me and the youngest one was 14 years older than me so oh, wow. they were they were coming of age in the 
late 40s and 50s. Mm-hmm. And um, it, there wasn't an opportunity for them at that time. It wasn't even considered a role for women at the time to uh, I, I haven't been able in my research, I haven't been able to find much that I found stuff that supports this, that, you know, in terms of a careers for women at the time, being a funeral director wasn't one of those those options. Mm-hmm. Time for a real quick break. Make sure you like and subscribe. Liking the video will show it to more people on YouTube and subscribe. You will make sure you get access to all my great content in the future. And now back to the video. Mm-hmm. So they, they did things. They went to college. They pursued different careers, got married, had children. Uh, but so for them, it, it never if I don't think it was ever a choice. For my brothers and I, my brother was born in 1940. I was born in 50. My other brother was born in 51. It was more of a choice. We could, we had the option. My uncle and dad never really um, intentionally um, uh, recruited us or hmm. uh, or did things to say, we, you know, we've started this for you. Now you're going to take it over. They, um, we always had the message that this is there for you if you want to pursue it. Mm-hmm. But we want we want you to have the experiences of your schooling, other careers, other interests. And that's really what happened. Um, myself, I I thought about it and I knew where I could go to school if I wanted to get an a undertaking degree. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just I pursued a bachelor's degree in political science and education and became a teacher. Uh, my older brother, he became a banker and a finance person. Mm-hmm. And uh, my younger brother uh, became a business owner and a contractor uh, building. So, but we've talked about, though, just how the skills we observed in my uncle and my dad have in- affected us in all our careers. Hmm. So, and for myself, it's just being a teacher, a principal, educator. The idea of that whole aspect of being of service, of being um, in a role where people are counting on you to provide and to, as an educator, being able to do things spontaneously as well as planned. Certainly, I, I learned that from from my dad and my uncle that uh, and watch, watching them, how they um, cared for and treated people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I learned those skills from them and employed those through my college years and into starting my career and up to the, my retirement for three years ago from education. So up to the time I was 70. So, mm-hmm. uh, but there was always, I mean, even in the lighter side as a school principal, uh, we had a lot of events at our elementary school, of course, oftentimes as a principal, I was setting up and taking down chairs and arranging, uh, getting ready for a program. And oftentimes I think, Hey, Kev, this is like you did in the funeral home. (laughs) You were getting ready for funerals and wakes and moving furniture around, moving furniture, getting ready for people to come to your house, getting, Mm -hmm. in this case, it was getting ready to come to my school. So I would, I would rib myself a little bit as I, in my with my, my my doctorate in education and, and being a principal and still hey Kev, you're still taking down and setting up chairs <laughs> just yeah. like you did as a kid yeah. so i mean that and that's just the physical thing but certainly in the emotional part and connecting with people and uh relationship wise i learned so so much uh from the funeral industry so much yeah it's interesting that you say that how those those basic skills translate into whatever you go into so your your career being very different from your brothers but still learning yeah. those, those those people skills and hospitality skills and you know from your father and yeah your yeah 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 and, I, and I, I i dare say my and my all of my brother my both my brothers are active in community organizations and and not, not only civic but business and bringing people together and organizing and uh taking leadership roles and things. So we've all ended up doing things like that. And I think that was just part of what we learned from, Mm -hmm. from my, not only from my uncle and my dad, but also from my mom and my aunt, that's just how they operated the business. And we got, we, we lived and breathed it. So we watched it all the time. So you you mentioned the stages in the, uh, in the, in the upper floor. And you mentioned the fact that you and your cousins would play on the stage. And apparently that became part Mm -hmm. of what you continue to do after that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. I never, um, 
I never, I didn't pursue it professionally, but uh, yeah, in high school doing plays and it was, and even, <laughs> even in the funeral, I, I always, my, our, my fam, our families were always having playing records and albums there in the fifties and sixties, oftentimes Broadway show tunes and, and popular singers. And at an early age, I got acquainted with uh, musical scores and, and uh, the idea of, and my parents taking us to plays in the mm-hmm. suburbs and also in Chicago. And I, one of my kid, young kid ideas of recreation was to, to, to play those songs and to sing and to dance. And sometimes when the, when there wasn't a wake going on or a funeral going on, I would just take my cassette tape recorder and I'd go down to the funeral chapel <laughs> and it's in the book. I say, this was my stage. This was my venue. Mm. And I would turn that cassette player up and I might pretend I'm Tony from West Side Story <laughs> or Curly from Oklahoma or, or something. Mm-hmm. Um, or maybe even I'd pretend I was, was a Mary Martin from Sound of Music, <laughs> whatever the, whatever it was at the time. Yeah. Uh, but, but I was always intrigued with, with those kind of uh, music. And, and now, uh, in my adult life, I've just always pursued com- community theater. And uh, when I was raising my kids, I did that. Or if people needed in a civic organization to have somebody sing, or even as a principal, I well, some people called me the singing principal because I would engage the kids in song and, and do mm-hmm. stuff like that. And, and, uh, and just recently I did a play down here in, um, um, in Fort Lauderdale. They have a, a great, community theater group that i got that i'm involved in so it's so i started doing this i've been doing this for i'd say almost 65 70 years just dabbling in it and uh and having fun with it and and that being another outlet for me a creative outlet for me mm-hmm. so but that i get that from my parents and my aunt and uncle because they they always had music playing and i talk about that in the book there's always music going on either on a record or playing the piano or people singing or family gatherings or taking us to plays uh, or dad would work on sets and do stuff like that. Mom would be a director of a play. Mm -hmm. Dad would be a director. I mean, so that was an influence for us all along, all along. So, so I know, I know a big part of your book is, is preserving and and, and moving forward your family legacy. So tell me about how the letters came together to to organize this. Thank you for that question. Yeah. Well, one of the motivating forces to write the book was knowing I had all these stories in my head and knowing that from my mom and dad and aunt and uncle, there are now about, I think I, at last count, I think we're at 152 offspring. You know, I think we're in the great, great, maybe even great, great, great grandchildren part from my, from my aunt and uncle. Uh, but we're, we're getting there. So I, I knew the other mission was I wanted to tell people these stories. And as my generation is start, is dying off more, I thought, hey, these we all have our stories, but some, and somebody would say, Kevin, when are you gonna, who's gonna write these stories down? So mm-hmm. that was part of my motivation. But the other incentive was from family letters that had been sent back and forth when people used to write letters. <laughs> right. And, um, and that would, I've got a letter uh, in there. I think the earliest one is from 1939 when my mother wrote, we have a, a letter that she wrote to her parents on the night of her honeymoon, just telling them, thank you for their wedding and thank you for all that. So that's probably the, I've got a couple that are earlier than that, but that's the one I start with in the book. Hmm. And then in this one, as I got going to, um, and then when my, my niece, my three cousins moved away, had their families that they would write letters and write back and forth. So there's those letters that went back and forth. And then as I got into going away to college in, in 1968, that's the bulk of the letters are from the years um, 68 to 72, 73. And just letters that my mom and dad, aunt and uncle wrote to me, whether mm-hmm. I was at school in Chicago or I had also a year that I, I um, went to school as a junior uh, in Rome, Italy. And then when I graduated, I moved to San Francisco in the Bay Area. So the letters went back and forth. And I saved the letters that they sent to me. They in turn, and my mom, I have a point in the book where mom writes me in 1970 when I'm a student in Rome. And she said, we're saving all these letters. Hmm. And uh, and she said, someday 
I wrote her back and I said, that's great, mom. I'll save the ones you send me too. Maybe someday uh, we'll be able to read them to each other. Lo and behold, <laughs> in 2010, my mom is in failing health and she's unable to hold a book in her hand anymore, but she still loves to be read to. Mm -hmm. So I was sitting on her with her on her terrace. She was living the last few months of her life in Hallandale Beach, Florida, and she had a terrace overlooking the ocean. And so we're out there one day and she said, I said, Mom, maybe I'll just read to you from these notebooks of letters that I have. And I just put them, I opened them up rather randomly. And the one this in this random fashion, I went to the letter that she had written me in 1970 telling me, um, mm -hmm. I'm going to save your letters. And I'm, and my return was in there too. Yeah, someday we're going to be able to read these out loud to each other. Wow. I think I know I had goosebumps on my arms and I looked at my mom and she was, uh, she died about three months later, but at that time she was crying. She mm -hmm. said, isn't it amazing that this really happened? So the letters became a treasure trove. And so as I, um, Oh, in the early, maybe around 2005 or six, somewhere about that. I had all these letters in boxes and folders and file folders. By the time I did that reading session with my mom, I had them organized into notebooks. And what I did is I had taken all the letters and I had um, just laid them out at random and then started organizing them by year. Hmm. I think I started with decade and then I went decade down to year and then year and the month and month and the day. And then I just put them all in sequence in a notebook. I still have them. Uh, uh, so now I have five four-inch uh, four wide three-ring binders, which hold all these letters that are preserved in, in plastic sleeves. Mm -hmm. And with the envelopes in a lot of cases and the postmarks and all that too. So a lot of the stories in the book uh, are either, each chapter is either launched due to one of these letters or I'll... I'll reference the letter if I'm talking about a certain theme or a certain aspect uh, in the book. The um, the other thing I, I talk about in the book, uh, in since I know the audience is also people that are younger, and I is writing it for my our progeny, our 150 offspring. A lot of them don't have any concept <laughs> what letter writing is, you know, and so I would I make reference and point out, hey, this is the way our family. And many families communicated. We didn't have email. We didn't have the expeditiousness of, of a text. Mm -hmm. We uh, Our routine at home was to go to the mail at 1030 every day and, and in the house and look forward to what was there. And certainly it was your bills and your flyers and business. But then there was letters there, too, mm -hmm. and notes and cards and um, I kid my 39, our, my 39 year old son. Now I'll say, uh, Hey, I, I sent you a card. Did you get it? He said, Oh, I haven't checked my mailbox in about two weeks. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, there isn't even an interest in doing it. And where it was for us in our house at that time, it was a lifeblood. It was, it was more than a routine. It was something that, well, the business depended on it, uh, the mail, but also for the correspondence. Mm -hmm. And so, to put those letters together and get them organized and 700 pages of it turned out to be about 700 pages that I have in these notebooks of, of letters. And, and it's so for me, it's a wonderful thread uh, that, that takes the stories. And in my book, I decided early on as I was writing, Hey, this is not a book that's going to like some memoirs are, um, I was born in this year and then the next thing that happened to me and everything. And when I got out of diapers, no, I didn't, I didn't do that part. Right. I, 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 as I looked at the letters and started to lay out all uh, the things that were happening in in my uh, thoughts and in the letters, a lot of themes started to come out. So that's the book is based on themes and, and there is some sequence to the book, mm -hmm. but it, it intertwines itself with, with the themes that are going on in our family and, themes of uh, family togetherness and themes of crises and themes of joy, but also themes of sadness and, and themes of, uh, Oh, even in with the 1960s and seventies, there's a whole chapter on hair because mm. with the advent of the Beatles and hairstyles changing, especially for men at that time, boys, mm -hmm. 
that was a big deal in our house. <laughs> mm. And uh, so that cha- that chapter is called Give Me a Head of Hair um, and just different things that happen in the family in regards to hair or every almost all the adults in the house smoked. And mm-hmm. that chapter smoke gets in your eyes. And how did they undo themselves for those addictions and uh, how it was a, a focus at the time uh, of how the seriousness of smoke and so th- mm-hmm. those are some of the things. And, and then I weave different historical references throughout the book, whether it's the, the president at the time or might be Vietnam or, or the Nixon Watergate tapes or uh, just different things that were happened to give sort of a baseline to what's happening in our family with mm-hmm. what's happening internationally or, or nationally as well. So how how was uh, how was your family reacted to responded to the book? Oh. Well, the co- I was telling you about my cousin who just died. She was one of my uh, my readers, along with a few other people, mm-hmm. and her, her their reactions were always supportive. I mean, I was having that her and, and my two brothers and a couple other cousins just read different sections because I wanted to make sure that I was just to reassure myself that I was being authentic and I, I wasn't making anything up because <laughs> mm-hmm. sometimes the 70 year old brain will memory. I think it's clear, but I wanted to make sure. So no, the family has been very supportive. Um, last, uh, last Christmas for the hol- holidays, um, my brothers arranged to give all their uh, grandchildren copies and children copies. And so we had a presentation at uh, during our holiday celebration where they all got a signed copy and the kids have written some of the kids have written me to say I didn't know that and thanks for telling me this and and then that, that extends into other cousins and stuff too so the family the family's been very receptive and I've uh, I've cause I, almost to the point of asking is there anything here you don't <laughs> it's printed now but yeah, is there yeah. anything else i can i can correct in a newsletter that i send out no nobody has come forward with that so i think uh we've all been pretty much in agreement and i think now the family just um treats it as as a record treats it as a something that they can continue to pass on to their Mm -hmm. children and if they get um i've had some people say i went back to that chapter again because i wanted to make sure what you said (laughs) So it's it's sort of I think for there's a and there's a family tree in embedded in the book, so you know they'll go back there to say oh I was for I forgot that's how we're related or I forgot about that part. Mm-hmm. So it, it it's uh, the family's been really good about it and and uh, very fun and they're encouraging me to write another one. So I'm ready to go, ready to go. Awesome. So yeah. would have been would have been the. Uh responses from the people from your readers just the general readers that have picked up the book oh okay let's see do i have something with me hold on for a second (laughs) wait a minute sure I was looking in this coffee shop. You usually have some postcards here, but they're all gone, fortunately. <laughs> so somebody took the postcards. Hope that. <laughs> but um, the reaction of readers has just been, oh, this recently I got a uh, uh, a call from a high school social studies teacher hmm. that, I, that I've kept sort of in contact with, but not spent. I've been out of high school or more than uh, 55 years. But he just called, he texted me and he said, hey, I got your number and I just read the book and, and, uh, I was making some connections. Well, can you give me a call? Uh, and I get, you know, bits of feedback. So we had a great chat, you know, about mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. And one of the, uh, uh, when you look at the Amazon reader reviews, uh, we got about uh, close to a hundred of those right now. Mm-hmm. And just different people's saying one, one person said, um, Hey, the house itself is like a character. And the way I, I describe the house and the, how, if I say that if in a different kind of physical house setting, our families may not have built the kind of relationships we had. The mm-hmm. house itself becomes a character. Another, I've had a couple people write to me or in reviews say, um, "Hey, this is this is like the real uh, Six Feet Under family." I'm not sure if you're familiar with that HBO series of about 20 years ago, mm-hmm. Six Feet Under. Mm-hmm. And so I, I get feedback from um, that way, and also. 
when I'm uh, checking in with some of the people that are still talking about Six Feet Under online. I'll let them know that I have this book and then they'll write back to me because um, I think our family is a little less quirky than the family on <laughs> Six Feet Under. But anyway, it, it just it talks about how how fam how family business works. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's uh, I've gotten some interesting reactions. Um, one of the if on Amazon, it, when books sell, they um, they get different rankings and the rankings could change in a day because you know, even one if you sell one one more book, it's going to might change your rankings and things. Mm -hmm. And also the categories you're listed in. I think maybe you've got a book yourself. You probably you know that. Um, but the, the idea that for a while I was getting rated uh, in the top 10 and 20 for teen and young adult readers. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. Hmm. Um, when I first marketed the book, I figured the demographic was more like 40 to, to death, right, yeah. <laughs> the readers. But um, so what I've taken to realize um, in talking to other people is teens and young adults might focus. They're, they're intrigued with the idea of, being raised and living in a funeral home. Mm -hmm. They're also in, and th some of them, um, it's also been ranked um, for entrepreneurs and, and business owners. Cause I spent some time uh, in the book weaving in stories about how my dad and uncle marketed the business, mm -hmm. especially a brand new business in 1930. How do you do that? Well, some of those lessons that are in there could be applied to entrepreneurs now. And I think maybe that's another reason. Uh, so it's been an unexpected audience for the book and, and one that I'm I, I, I'm working on to try to get more get in front of people of that age uh, to do that and talk about uh, how, how did people do start a business in 1930 in the midst of the depression if they could do it in 1930 and the business was a funeral home think what you could do in in 100 years later in, in 2023 so th that's been another fun thing in terms of the audience beyond the family has been r really fun to, to watch and to and uh, see how that evolves and when I get in front of people and stuff too. It's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. So as you've, you know, over the, over the decades since you lived, you know, in, in the funeral home and, and as you've grown and, and I'm sure probably experience, I know you've lost cousins and your parents and stuff. Mm -hmm. How do you feel? How, how is your view on grief or losing people? How has that evolved over the, t over the period of time? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to take your question and sort of dovetail it into other things I've heard you talk about with other guests. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I want to sh share a couple of things that um, how the people that have passed before me are still with me. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I know that's a topic that, that, uh, oh, what was it? Who was the person I listened to recently? I got to put my glasses on. Oh, then, well, not only near death. Yeah. The near death experience talk, but um also, just uh, when oh, your guest uh, Ed, Edmund uh, Grinnan was talking about Alzheimer's and yeah, how yeah. and and people that have passed on before him. Well, my father and I talk about this in the book. The couple not couple days before my father died, he was with hospice in his own home, and at that time, my children were um, two and six months, just very young. Mm -hmm. And I took him over to the house, my parents' house, and I just laid the two of them next to my father, who was in and out. He was conscious in and out. Mm -hmm. um, and he uh, he was said, oh, I'm so, so great to have the boys laying here next to me. And he said, hey, hey, Kev, we got to get that condo sold. Story being that my wife and I and the kids had lived, were in a condo, but we were trying to sell the house, sell it so we could get a bigger house. This is 1984. And um, we had it had been on the market uh, almost a year. And we hadn't had one person look at the place. Hmm. I'm, I'd have to go back and see what the real estate market conditions were at the time. I don't remember. But at the time, at the, so this particular evening, I told my dad, I said, well, hey, this week we've got a new realtor. We decided that we'd switch over to a new realtor. Mm -hmm. Her name's Cindy. And uh, she's working on it. He said, oh, that'll be good. I mean, he's, then he said, one of his last words to me was, we have to get that place sold so you can find something else. We. <laughs> hmm. So that was that was Friday night. 
Um, I didn't, uh, he died Sunday morning at seven o'clock and I, I didn't see him on Saturday. Mm. So, um, Tuesday is the, uh, the wake and I'm standing in line and Cindy, the realtor comes through the line and she's talking to me and she's, uh, Kev, I, I think I might have somebody interested in your house, in your condo. I said, wait a minute. I said, this place, you just took it over. This place has been. Um, on the market for a year, we haven't had a nibble. And she says, well, I know you'll be busy with the funeral tomorrow, but I'm going to show it to this, this, this prospect and see what he thinks. I said, okay, keep me posted. So I was busy that next, the next day, of course, with the funeral and, Mm -hmm. um, Thursday, Thursday, uh, after the next day I get a call from her and she says, the guy, this guy wants to make an offer. And I said, wait a minute. (laughs) She says, I think your dad is working on this. Mm-hmm. And she had never had the opportunity. I don't think she may have had the opportunity to meet my dad. I can't remember. But she says, I think your dad's working on this. And when I think back to his last comment to me, we have to get this place sold. Mm-hmm. I got to believe. <laughs> I got to believe that if he died on Sunday morning, um, he, he, he in his own way mm-hmm. and had position he was taking found this person. It was a single man looking for a place to buy. I think dad found him. I really do. Mm. <laughs> and made, and, and found, because the, the, the store, uh, Cindy tell me, she says, yeah, I heard in the office, there was this young kid looking for a place to buy. And so, however, to this day, I still think that that's the reason it happened, <laughs> that it was his dad's interest in me, interest in his grandkids, his love for us, knowing that we were working pretty hard to get it sold. And then his state, his, his last words to me, we got to get this place sold. Wow. He took, he took that. We seriously. I right, think. Right. And, uh, and by November of that year, he died in early September by Thanksgiving of that year. I, I we were in our house. We had, hmm. you know, sold our condo, bought a house and it moved. So uh, I, I, when I think of experiences like that, uh, I just, I don't know. I think, uh, I think this happens to a lot of people Mm -hmm. and it's not uncommon. And you too have have, have talked about, um, was it the ice cream store that your daughter liked and stuff? Uh, was, uh, was it that you're, this is the place you drive by that where you're, you used to, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And you just feel a connection there and things. And I I think it's, uh, the people that have gone before us, I think, they have a way of communicating, and mm-hmm. uh, I, I, I think if and if we listen and we pay attention, we're going to get those messages and stuff. But I think that's I'm not sure what your question was. I talk, well, it was, but I just it was about how your how your view of grief or or, or loved oh, okay. ones, you know, how that how that might have evolved over over the years. Um, so I'm just I I'm curious, growing up in that with that industry, because you said your father didn't, and your uncle didn't really bring it home, but. Did they talk to you about spirituality when you were when you were younger, or what were your beliefs then? Well, uh, yeah, they talked to us. Not um, we were raised Catholic, okay. Um, so that's you know at that time that was pretty uh, serious, regular church going, and mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. every every Sunday, and uh, and my cousins and my brothers and I all went to parochial school for elementary and high school. So we all had that influence on a daily basis. Sure. Um, I mean, sometimes I would in elementary school, I would have they would take the kids who are altar boys like myself and they would take us over to church to say we needed to. And they would call it serve the funeral and be the altar boys for the funeral. Mm-hmm. And sometimes my dad and uncle would would be the people that were doing the funeral. So right. here I'm doing the church function and they're doing on that so no and we did our family was very big on the religious the, or in this case catholic mm-hmm. the rituals and the routines and the beliefs and the uh my my uncle was very uh, insistent that my brother and i become altar boys mm-hmm. and i talk in the book about how he he took us under his wing and and worked with the the, the nuns and the priests to to know what to teach us and practice with us. And some of my fondest memories of my uncle are sitting in his lap, learning how to say the Latin prayers. You know? mm. So, and, and he, for whatever reason, he took on that role and, and my dad didn't, I don't know. I, well, I think it was all set up that 
um, my, my uncle was doing it because he wanted to make this a surprise for my mom and dad. Hmm. <laughs> so he took us under his wing and did that. So, yeah, I, I have you know felt that kind of presence, that ritual, knowing my dad and uncle were always ushers and dad was active at church doing decorating and helping wherever he could. The church was a big part of the life, the parish was a big part of their life. And, and I, I had that kind of influence okay. from a spiritual sense. So, and you know, doing things like making, we called them May altars in May for the, for the, for the blessed Virgin, and, and mm-hmm. doing all those kind of things that dad would help with. And, and, and being a parochial school, school student, you, you did those kind of things. So, yeah. 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 Great. Well, um, Kevin, thank you so much for being here today and, and sharing your, your family with us and your, your family's legacy and, and your book. Uh, remind people of the name of your book and where sure. they can get it. And if people can reach out to you, if they have questions or want to contact you, let them know that information as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you'll put this in the liner notes as well, I presume. Yeah, too? Yes. yeah mm-hmm. that's what I thought. Well, uh, people can get a hold of me in a few ways. One is to go to my website. It's Kevin O'Connor author.com. And it's, um, uh, you can, that's one way to go. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is to just, if they go to uh, Amazon, mm-hmm. they can just type in the title two floors above grief. And that's the only title that pops up. And so they can go there to learn more about the book. And there's a little, there's more uh, detail about different synopsises of the book and mm-hmm. people that have written some reviews and, and reviewers uh, to tell you a little more about the background. Uh, that's there too. Uh, the other thing, um, my phone, people can contact me just through text uh, at 815 546 1076. So those are three, three ways that they can get a hold of me directly. A lot of times, with people's permission, uh, what I do is I, I have them s- sign up for a newsletter that I put out, uh, and that comes out usually every Friday or Saturday, and it mm-hmm. just talks about what's going on with the book. We're having a um, we're coming up on the one year anniversary, so we're going to have a first year anniversary Zoom celebration nice. in early December, and uh, I keep up with people about what events I'm going to this weekend. We're going to the uh, Miami Book Fair, so we'll be there. And I'll meet people that way. Uh, and there's different local events I do or when I'm traveling, I, I try to make contact with a bookstore or a coffee shop and meet there. So there's I'm on the road. And then we have another thing that's called uh, Where on Earth is uh, Two Floors Above Grief. So I will put that as detail some of that in the newsletter. Mm. Also, I ask friends if they're taking a trip, if they can squeeze the book into their uh, luggage or they can use their Kindle, but if they're having to be reading the book at some place they're traveling to, like uh, a friend of mine was in Scotland two or three weeks ago, and he took pictures of the book at different locations in Scotland. Some of my uh, granddaughters have t- took the book to, to uh, Madrid and posed it in different ways and things cool. like that. So that's nice. where on earth is two floors above grief. So I have, I just want my community of readers and, and people that are interested in they have fun with it like I'm having fun with it. I mean, not all the book is fun, <laughs> but yeah. there, I, I get in like you use the word poignancy. And there's, um, you know, there's stories of different stories of the people that died in the family and how we dealt with it. In fact, mm-hmm. the, the last seven chapters are all about the people that have preceded me in death and, and what their funerals were like and what their mm-hmm. last days were like. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I stole that idea from six feet under a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. But uh just to uh, to do that and 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 how we experienced it at those times. So that's what I do. So those are the ways they can uh, hear more from me or uh, get a hold of the book. And I encourage them to do it. And I hope they have uh, they, they enjoy it. Oh, the the audible version is out now too. Awesome. So the uh, I didn't I didn't narrate it myself, but the, you can get the audible version just by going to Amazon as well. And if they want to support their local bookstores, whether it be a independent store or a Barnes and Noble any one of those places they can go to and just give the title and they can order it from the store. The stores, a lot of times in the self-publishing world, uh, the the stores don't carry self-published authors, mm-hmm. but yeah. uh, if a person wants the, uh, wants the book, they can just order it in this. I haven't heard of a store yet that 
was uh, that didn't order it for people. So that's right. good too. Great. Well, again, Kevin, thanks so much for being here today. Um, Brian, I appreciate and I, I really enjoy your podcast. I, I want to keep listening to them as I'm, I'm walking and doing stuff because you certainly have a, a great uh, array, uh, I guess, of guests and the people that you that you welcome into your, your room. It's very nice. All right. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Hey, thanks. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.